Hey there devs! Are you ready to start developing Android apps? The first thing you're probably going to need to do is to set up your development machine with Android Studio and other tools that will let you build those apps. Now that can be a daunting process if you've never done it before. And oftentimes you just keep finding more and more things that you need to download and install. And if you've been doing this for a while, you've probably experienced that before every time you switch development machines and just realize how much there really is to set up. So in this video, we're gonna walk through how to set up your Windows machine for Android development. We'll install Android Studio, the Android SDK, maybe some emulators, and a few other tools that will help us in our day-to-day -day development process. So, first things first, let's download Android Studio. So if we open up our web browser, and search for Download Android Studio, we can follow the first available link and we'll be taken to the Downloads page. This page will automatically recognize our platform, so we can simply click Download Android Studio, select the Terms and Conditions, and hit Download for Windows. We have Android Studio downloaded. Let's walk through the install process and get it ready to go on our machine. So once the install is complete, we can double click on the downloaded executable and this will pull up the install wizard. From here, we can hit next throughout the entire process and leave the system defaults. Once we're at the end, we'll click install and this will bring us to this nice loading screen that we'll have to sit through for a while. Once the download is complete, we can hit finish and will then be prompted to import settings. If this is the first time you've installed Android Studio, select Do Not Import Settings and hit OK. After that, we'll be presented with the Setup Wizard so we can configure our installation. On the first screen, we'll hit Next, and then we'll select Standard Installation. For me personally, I prefer the darker theme, but choose whatever you prefer and hit Next and finally select Finish. From here, a number of components will be downloaded and installed for us. Now this process can take a while, but once it's done, go ahead and select Finish and the initial setup will be complete. Before we really get up and running, we're gonna want to update our SDK installation and install a few different versions of Android. Most likely, you'll want to at least install whatever your minimum API level is going to be and your target API level is going to be. You'll also probably want to download the sources for that SDK level and also probably some emulators for that. So we'll walk through that process right now. Open up Android Studio, select the Configure option, and click SDK Manager. From here, we can install and update the different SDK platforms that we'll use to develop with. So in this case, I'm going to select to update Android 8.1 and install Android API level 28. We'll then select to update the Android emulator. When we're done, we can hit apply and then okay, and this will kick off the download process. Now this process can take a while, but once you're done, you should have the different API levels available to you so that you can set perhaps your min and your max API, hopefully be able to click into the sources to actually see what is happening behind the framework API calls, as well as being able to create and configure emulators to test your code on. Once the download's complete, select Finish. You can then hit OK to dismiss the SDK Manager dialog. And from here, we can start a new project. Click Start a new Android Studio project, and this will start the project creation wizard. In this case, we'll just hit Next after selecting Kotlin support. We can choose what target platforms we want and select our API levels. We can then choose to configure a starting activity 
And when we're all said and done, we can click finish. And this will create the process for us, download any of the Gradle dependencies that we need, and then configure and prepare the project so that we can start to develop our new app. When that's all finished, Android Studio will open up into the editor and we'll be able to browse and edit our new app code. So now we've downloaded a few emulators, let's take a look at how to actually set those up, as well as maybe some tricks to help us make better use of those emulators in our day-to-day -day work. We'll open up the Virtual Device Manager, and because we don't have any emulators already available, we'll see this first screen where we can then select Create Virtual Device. So here we can choose what hardware we want to emulate with this particular emulator. And you can see we have a number of form factors to choose from, whether that's TV, phone, wear, tablets. And so it's a good idea to actually create a number of emulators to test whatever devices your app will be running on. In particular, it's a good idea to have a phone and a tablet. So in this case, I'll select a Pixel 2 XL and now we'll need to select our API level. In my case, we want to target API 28. So I will download the AP 28 system image so that I can test on whatever my target SDK will be. Once we select download, we'll have to accept the license agreement for that emulator. We can then select next and the download will start. Now downloading an emulator can take quite a while, so be patient, but once you're done, you'll be able to start testing your new application code. While we wait for the download to finish, let's talk about some good practices to get into the habit of while using your emulators. I already mentioned that it's a good idea to test on both phones and tablets and any other form factor that you're targeting. It's an also good idea to test different API levels, particularly your lowest and your target API level. It can also be a good idea to test different locales, and you might want to test these frequently, so you could set up an emulator for a specific locale or for a specific device configuration if you know there is a device type that commonly causes problems for your application. Once the system image is downloaded, we can select it and hit next, we can then configure the virtual device by naming it or changing the properties, but in this case, we'll leave the defaults and then select Finish. Once your emulator is created, you should be able to see it listed in your virtual device manager. Now that we have a phone emulator set up, let's set up a tablet. This time I'll select a Pixel C, I'll select Next, this time I want to download a lollipop system image because that's my min SDK. Once that's finished downloading, again, I'll select it, hit next. I'll leave the defaults and select finish. Now that we have both a phone and tablet emulator ready to go, we're in a great place to start testing our app. Let's launch both of these emulators just to see what they look like on our development machine. So we can select each one individually and click the little green play icon over to the right, and we'll see the emulators launch on our computer. You can see we can drag the emulators around, resize them, we can change their orientation, we can really work with them as if they were real physical devices, which makes it great for testing. All right. Android Studio is installed, the SDK, we've got a couple emulators. What else should we be installing? One thing I always like to set up on my machine is my version control system. And most of the time I'm using Git. So we can navigate to our Android Studio preferences and update our GitHub configuration so that it remembers your GitHub account information, which will make it easier when integrating with Git services through Android Studio. So in this case, I'll enter my login email, enter a password. Because I have two-factor authentication enabled, I'll then have to receive and enter my authentication code. But once I have that, 
GitHub will be set up and ready to go within Android Studio. I also like to work with Git from the terminal window within Android Studio. To do that on Windows, I'll install git bash. If you search for Windows install git, we can follow the first link that pops up. From here, we can jump to the install git on Windows section that you can see over in the top left. We'll then follow the instructions and download the Git for Windows installer. Once the installer is downloaded, we can double click on it to load the executable and start the install process. We can follow the install wizard by repeatedly selecting next we can choose which components we want to enable. You can also choose your default editor. I'm comfortable with Vim, so I'm going to leave it here, but you might want to start off with something like Notepad++, VS Code, Atom, whatever your preferred text editor is. Once that's configured, select Next. You can then adjust your path environment in this case, we'll leave it as the default and hit Next. We'll select Next on this screen as well. And finally, we'll select the Install option to finish the installation process. Once you select Finish, we can choose to launch git bash, and we can then test out the functionality. So we'll have a terminal window open, and we can use familiar Unix style commands to work with git from our Windows machine. Next, we'll configure the Android Studio terminal tool to launch the git bash executable by default this will let us use Git Bash from Android Studio's terminal window. After restarting Android Studio and opening the terminal window, we'll now see the Git Bash environment is loaded by default, and we can use those familiar Git commands right from Android Studio. Next up, I actually want to take a look at how we can change the theme and the editor styles of our IDE. So if we search for IntelliJ themes, one of the first things that popped up is this material theme UI. This will change what Android Studio's interface looks like and give it a more material look and feel. Now, I personally like this, so this is something that I will sometimes install on my machines. You also see that there is this rain glow color schemes and if we go down here to color themes, you'll notice a whole array of different editor themes that we can download and install to change how our code looks like. Now it's really nice to customize the color look and feel of your IDE because you do spend so much of your day staring at code and staring at IntelliJ or Android Studio. So it's worth spending a little bit of time and customizing it to fit your preferences and pick something that you don't mind looking at for hours on end. So I personally like Solarized Dark, so I'll download this one so I can enable this as my editor theme of choice. Now let's enable Solarized Dark as our editor color of choice. So if we go to Android Studio Settings, and if we look under the Editor section and go to Color Scheme, we can then choose to import a scheme. We'll navigate to our downloaded solarized dark jar. We'll select it and hit OK. We can hit apply 
And now we'll see solarized dark colors used for our code within the editor. If we go back to the Android Studio settings, we'll go to the plugins section and we'll click browse repositories and search for material. We can then find that material theme UI that we saw earlier in the search window. If we install that plugin and restart Android Studio, we'll now see our editor takes on a different look and feel based on that new material UI theme. And here, now that Android Studio is restarted, we immediately notice the progress bar looks different, the icons look different, and in general, it just changes the appearance, the look and feel, and if it's something you like, you could try out this plugin. Once I've set up my color scheme, I also like to go in and configure what my console output colors will be. By default, these will come from the color scheme, but I find that I like to keep my console output looking the same regardless of the rest of my code. So I personally like to make sure that my error output is always some type of red and my warnings are some type of orange. So in this case, we'll go to the settings, we'll open up the console colors underneath the editor color scheme setting options, and then we'll modify the colors of each of these console options. So select console error output and make that a red. And then we'll come down to log console, select warning, and we'll make that an orange. We'll then hit apply. And next we'll go over under the color scheme options and select Android Logcat. And here we can customize the Android Logcat specific coloring. So if we select warning, we'll notice that it's actually a shade of teal, and we'll see that it's inheriting a value from the parent, which is back in the original console colors section. So if we unselect inherit values from, and then the default, we can override these. So in this case, I'll override warning as an orange. We'll make debug some type of yellow. And finally, We'll choose assert and make that some type of purple so that all the values are very distinct. Making them distinct will greatly improve readability when viewing console output. There's just a few more things I want to briefly mention. As I said before, you might want a text editor. And there are a number of great options out there such as VS Code, on Windows Notepad++, Atom. Find something that you're comfortable working with or maybe you're comfortable from the command line, that's absolutely okay as well. Just find what works for you and don't let yourself become hindered by the lack of a good text editing tool because more than likely you're going to use that very frequently. I also highly encourage you to take a look at your Android Studio shortcuts. Becoming familiar with shortcuts, even if it's just one or two at a time, can greatly improve your efficiency as a developer. If you're coming from a different Android Studio setup or maybe a different operating system such as Linux or Mac, you can also customize the shortcuts to match what you're more comfortable with. So me personally, when I go from my work computer, which is a Mac, to my personal computer, which is a PC, I map those shortcuts so that they're similar on both platforms and I don't have to remember two very distinct sets of shortcuts. All right. You are all set up and ready to go to start developing Android apps. What platform are you developing on? Windows? Mac? Should I be making a Linux version of this video? Comment down below. I'd love to hear what other people are working with and how it's working for you. Thanks so much for watching everybody. Until next time.